Well, welcome everyone to Glaucoma Yes or Glaucoma No. Tonight we have Dr. Joe Salka as our presenter. Dr. Joseph Salka is an attending optometric physician at Center for Sight in Sarasota, Florida. This is a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma management and really where he shines neuroophthalmic disease. He is also a director of optometric, he is also the director of optometric business development at USI. He was formerly a professor at, op, uh, of optometry at Nova Southeastern College of Optometry for 28 years. Joe, what about the two days where and he two, served? And, as, and two days. What, and two days where he served as the chief of advanced care service and director of the glaucoma service at the college's eye institute. He was the program coordinator and supervisor of the ocular disease residency. Dr. Salka is a founding member of both Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. He also is the founder and former chair of the Neuroophthalmic Disorders in Optometry Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Salka is a glaucoma diplomat of the American Academy of Optometry. He is a partner and co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. And with that, let's give him a big virtual round of applause. Joe, take it away. Thank you, Greg. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, to talk about this course, glaucoma yes or glaucoma no, this is actually something that kind of evolved organically when I taught the glaucoma course at Nova University. And uh, I actually talked about this. And it, you know, I have some former students uh, on, the, uh, on the webinar tonight. And they'll probably recognize, and this is something that they seem to uh, find humorous or embrace. And we talked about uh, optic nerve. Would I be show them? I would show the students uh, various optic nerves and, and ask them, say, glaucoma yes or glaucoma no, just based upon what you see with the op with the uh, with the optic nerve. And that kind of stuck with me. And you know, every year is glaucoma yes or glaucoma no. And the students seem to gravitate toward it. I mean, sometimes I, I see posts or social media things, glaucoma yes, glaucoma no. So I don't want to disappoint anybody. So we're going to launch into glaucoma yes or glaucoma no. What is our diagnosis? Now, these are my disclosures. In the past 12 months, I've been a consultant or a speaker or a member of the advisory board for Zeiss, Visus, and Bausch and & Lohm. Uh, I, I co-own this company with Greg. I've got no financial interest in any of the, uh, any of the uh, products we may discuss here. And really, most importantly, is I've created this myself. And this, is my, uh, this is my own uh, work, uh, work of uh, academic intellectual uh, uh, property. Now, one may ask about what is standard of care. I, I get this asked to me all the time. And, you know, we have a lot of devices out there and we have a lot of representatives who will start talking about the, the need for this or this is standard of care. Or if you're not doing this, you're not giving good glaucoma care. And, you know, we don't need a, a fifty or $60,000 instrument uh, to give good glaucoma care. What we need... Uh, is an ability to measure intraocular pressure, and that can be by by digital. That can be by anything but digital tensions. You know, Non-contact thermometry, you know, does measure IOP. We've got uh, we've got tunnel pen. We have Pascal. We have the Aura. We have the Eye Care rebound thermometry. You know, I was I was asked to opine for the the uh, Department of Health and the Florida Board regarding uh, what is standard and IOP measurement. And I think the issue kind of came down to uh, a member of the Flor you know, Florida optometric community had been man managing a patient with something other than Goldman intraocular pressure. And I think what they wanted as, as an academic glaucoma person would be to come out against that and state that Goldman applination is the only way and reality is any device that is, in my opinion, FDA approved to measure intra to measure intraocular pressure as well maintained and whoever uses it is well trained is adequate for me. I mean, we all do Goldman applination and in, in glaucoma for the most part, but I don't want to say that anything else is 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 bad care because it isn't. 
Then the gonioscopy is always something that we tend to forget about. A lot of people don't like doing gonioscopy. I can tell you it's it's not hard. You know, I I use a, a non-contact and a contact flange four mirror lens. Uh, and you know, it's it's done in just seconds. So the patients rarely ever have any issue. I think most of the problems come from our days in optometry school when we had it done on us and we didn't like it, and we were we were biased against it. And it just isn't a hard technique. Now Caveat, I've seen some good people get lost in, in angles that had very little pigment. I've seen people get lost in, in closed angles, and they start looking at the at corner reflexes a, a, as being the, uh, the angle structures. So practice, practice, practice. I think that's, uh, that's very, very important. Threshold perimetry, you know, this is something we need to do. We have to have some sort of threshold and algorithm or threshold perimetry. And we have to have an optic disc evaluation. Now, one, one is, it has been argued it's a stereoscopic evaluation of the optic nerve, but, you know, that would uh, negate the efforts of our amblyopic or monocular colleagues, which I don't want to do that, but a good quality evaluation of the optic nerve, I think, is, is what we need. So if you can measure ILP, do gonioscopy, perform threshold perimetry, and look at the optic nerve, not only meeting the glaucoma standard of care, you're really doing good care. Now, we can start going up. I mean, we can go up the ladder. You know, I think it's you know, easy and important to add pachymetry in there so we can know if this is a person who is at less risk or more risk of converting or progressing. And if you want to keep climbing that uh, practice ladder higher, we can have some sort of diagnostic imaging, you know, wide field imaging, uh, optical coherence, tomography, and geography, and photography. That's, I think, an underutilized uh, imaging technology. And that's one that's not going to change from platform to platform. Photos are photos. And we can look at that. Uh, always. And I think it's it's important we, we, we take photos and actually look at the darn things to see what we may or may not be missing. That's really how you're going to find neurofiber layer defects and, and some disc hemorrhages. Now we can go even higher and start looking at corneal hysteresis or the cornea's uh, uh, ability to handle stress. You know, there's a device called the ocular response analyzer that uh, is able to do that to give information. And of course, there's you know electrophysiology. The, you know, there's a, there's some units out there, including diopsis, which can give you some some information. Greg, what what are your thoughts on these? And I, I know you're experienced in some of these and, and have some have some definitive thoughts. You can share them if you don't mind with the audience. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the first one, Joe, is you know my soapbox regarding pack imagery is, you know. Do not adjust pressures based on cornea thickness that's out there. Um, I know when the first units came out back when the Oates study was released in the early 2000s, is, there was even cards even handed out. And I even found one the other day kind of buried somewhere. And, you know, we were told to adjust IOPs up and down. So my first clinical pearl out there regarding pack imagery is, you know, to me, 500 and less is thin. That puts the patient at increased risk. But remember, they have to have ocular hypertension. Um, patient comes in with a pressure of 20. It doesn't mean that their pressure is 23. Their pressure could be 18. Cornea rigidity has a lot to do with what's going on there. So don't adjust pressures up and down based on pack imagery. Low is high risk, like 500, 600-ish puts a patient at decreased risk. So decreased risk at 600, increased risk. But remember, they have to have um, ocular hypertension. Diagnostic imaging, we could spend a ton on that. OCT and photography, I think you said it well. I have the ocular uh, response analyzer in the practice. It's been really nice. I really put a little bit more weight on that cornea hysteresis me measurement. 10.5 is considered average. It's pretty amazing when you get down to that six or seven people with glaucoma, they, their ability to be able to dampen that energy. That's what that really means. Dampen that energy. Um, and that's the people that have the glaucoma. So when I have patients that come in with 21s and 22s and 23s, and they have a 10.5, 
not putting all my eggs in that basket, certainly putting a little bit more than pack imagery and saying that they have a little bit of a protective uh, value there. And that I really have never used diopsis and uh, uh, any ERG or electrophysiology in the practice. So I can't really speak much on that. So I'm the same. Uh, I think in one of our offices, we do have a unit for electrophysiology. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, avail myself of it. Pachymetry, I agree. When, when you say risk, you know, there's risk of converting from ocular hypertension to glaucoma with thin corneas and decreased risk with thick corneas. There's also increased risk of progression of existing glaucoma with thin corneas and decreased risk uh, with thicker corneas. And the caveat I always like to, to share with everybody is, well, I've seen patients with thick corneas get glaucoma, and I've seen patients with thin corneas uh, never develop any sort of, uh, any sort of uh, problem. And I'm, I'm, I'm with you in terms of the range, you know, the OAT study had 555 or less and 588 or more, but that was somewhat, uh, unre you know, not representative because, you know, there was a population of thick corneal patients uh, in that, in that study. So I look at just like you, Greg, 500 or less is thin, 600 or greater is, is, is thick. And I also have two more, I have two more categories. I, I consider like 520 thin-ish. I think 580 is thick-ish, but it doesn't really make a, a big difference until you hit that, uh, that, four, that uh, five to 600 range. And I guess the question is, how much information do we do we really need? Uh, you know, do we do we get maybe too much information? Uh, sometimes what we'll have is con con conf conflicting and contradictory inflammation, and we have to figure out what what is really important to examine. We can, I think, we can bury our ourselves in the data, and if we're not looking at everything critically and applying it clinically, you know, we are at the risk, you know, of, of making a mistake. You know, there's this trigger fish. You know, it's still a, uh, it's still an experimental uh, study type of device. It's a contact lens that is supposed to measure intraocular pressure. And I guess the question is, do we need to know what that that data is around the clock. And you know, we're not really entirely sure exactly what that trigger fish is, uh, is measuring, but you know, at some point, may maybe we start getting too much information. Well, you know, what is really important to examine? In my opinion, it's the optic nerve because glaucoma is a primary optic neuropathy. It's where all the action happens. I mean, there can be some risk factors or there are things that you you might not see, you know, that you can't actually see. You, you know, you can't see family history. You know, that's involved. You can't see interoperative pressure. Obviously, that is involved, but you can see things happening to the to the nerve, the parapapillary area that uh, is really pretty characteristic of, of glaucoma. And every, you know, you, you should, on a relatively routine basis, be bringing patients back for glaucoma evaluations just based upon what you saw in the fundus examination. You know, that's that is critically important. In fact, I, I can tell you. Uh, I think Thursday or Friday, I had a patient, and I realized. You know, there's no real risk factors. The pressure was probably 18 or so. But I looked at one optic nerve three times. And, and I told the patient, I said, look, I'm, I'm attuned to this. This is what I did. I did nothing but this for 18 years academically. If I have to look at, if I look at something three times, if, if it draws my attention, I, I said, that, that's enough. We got to do a workup. We, we have to bring it back and do some evaluations. <laughs> So the glaucoma suspect should be one based upon disc appearance. Of course, family history, race, age, that all plays a part. Uh, systemic history, that all plays a part. Uh, Interactive pressure, very important. 
But ultimately, you have to be able to make the, the suspicion based upon disc. And you know, as we know, larger disc will have larger cuffs, but the rim is symmetrical and intact. So glaucoma is going to be overdiagnosed in larger nerves, but it's going to be underdiagnosed in, in smaller nerves. And that's very important. So we have to be able to assess the, the size. And I, I do that very, very subjectively. So evaluating hey, hey, Joe, the disc. Joe, can you yeah, go right. back to that? Can sure. you go back to that, uh, that picture? What I want to point out, and just let everyone know, this is the first time, you know, Joe and I, or Joe's doing this and I get to see it. So I hope I don't step on your toes here, Joe. But Not at all. if you remember in the, in an OCT, because I'm sure you're going to see some OCT images here. Remember when you do a ganglion cell complex, remember that's the ganglion cell bodies. And then whenever you're doing a nerve fiber layer analysis, it's the nerve fiber layer. What I like to tell the patients is, and I like this picture here of what Joe has with these little fibers is that glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. In that optic nerve, there's about 1.2 million axons, right? So think about that axon over there at that macula. So glaucoma is kind of a macular disease now, if you think about it, and that's why we do some 10-2 visual fields because it's the ganglion cell that can die or the axon. So you have the ganglion cell so you have the, the, uh, the photoreceptors, the inner and outer nuclear layer, blah, 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 and the OCT. You finally get to the ganglion cell. Off the ganglion cell comes this axon. And just think how long that axon is. And Joe, if you can go back one more slide, that axon starts into the retina. You can see it goes through the optic nerve, through the chiasm, through the optic track, and eventually synapses at the lateral geniculate body. And that's that long axon that we have to keep alive and can get damaged. And that's what we're trying to measure. And it goes from 1.2 million to 1 million down to 800,000. That axon is what can get damaged, that axoplasmic flow, that whole way going back and forth. Things can get kinked at the lamina cribosa where it, where it bends there at the, at the optic at the optic nerve going into the retina. That's one really long axon that's out there. So just remember that axon, how long it is, and it's rooted at that ganglion cell. And that's what we do, ganglion cell analysis and nerve fiber layer analysis. Okay, I'm done ranting. Oh, excellent. And I'll think I was going to uh, bring that up. So that, that is great. Just a reminder, Greg, you may want to put the handouts in right now because somebody had asked for that. Perfect, thank you. So evaluating the disc in glaucoma, it takes a village. Characteristic glaucomatous neuropathy is focal damage. And it's not generalized, the concentric enlargement. Now, there are some conditions such as arteritic ischemic neuropathy, compressive lesions that will cause a concentric enlargement as well as vision loss uh, and optic nerve pallor, but nothing is gonna notch a, a rib like like glaucoma. That's that's the most important thing right there is glaucoma is going to do that. So we can see here if I cut the if I cut this in half, if I cut the optic nerve in half, I ask myself, does the uh, does the bottom look like the top? In this case it doesn't because there's focal notching and a wedge defect right here. Now, if I cut this one in half, it's relatively symmetrical and does follow what we call the isn't rule, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Now, ways in which we're still like a caveman, if we talk about glaucoma in cup to disc ratios. Now, I will tell you in the state of Florida, one of our, you know, in our practice act, that's one of the things we're obligated to write down. We have to write down a cup to disc ratio. But it's very, very unhelpful you know, because you have inter-observer variation of about 0.2. You have intra-observer variation. Sometimes I look back from year to year to see if I even agree with myself. So a change in cup to disc ratio is virtually meaningless, uh, even if you're the one who's looking at it. But we still have to put it down, but that's it's not really where we are in glaucoma. The critical optic disc evaluation, we have to look at the size. We have to look at the rim color. Look for focal rim defects, thinning, notching, whatever word you like to uh, use. We have to look for the presence or absence of disc hemorrhages, the presence or absence of nerve fiber layer defects, and the presence or absence of parapapillary atrophy. 
Now, I used to always teach my students parapapillary atrophy alone is never the di- is never the answer. You know, you're not you're not going to diagnose glaucoma based only on parapapillary atrophy. It is just a supporting or possibly indicative condition. When I look at an optic nerve, my first assessment is, does it look healthy or does it look sick? And if it looks sick, my, my, I ask myself, why does it look sick? And sometimes is, there is a fair amount of parapapillary atrophy. Now, size is relative. I don't measure things. I will look at size on an OCT. You know, for me, small is probably a 1.5 or less. Uh, 1.5 going up to about 1.9 millimeters is uh, average. Anything above that starts getting kind of large. Rim color, important. The rim is never pale in glaucoma. What I mean by that, I'm not talking about the 90 or 95% cupped nerve where everything looks pale because you're looking at scleral tissue and laminar cribrosa. Not talking about that. I'm talking a six or seven cup to disc ratio where you can actually see pallor of the neural retinal rim. And so these are all things that are very important. So size, I'm not taking a 60 diopter lens. I'm not using any, any, any scales to measure. I just look at it. It looks big, looks average, looks small. Right. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you feel comfortable in just kind of assessing it? You know, that's a large nerve. That's a small nerve. That's an average nerve. Yeah, I think that's a good approach to it. Small, medium, large. Um, you know, you can say macro disc, micro disc, normal disc. Okay, that's the terminology that's out there. And you can get you can have fun with some of the instruments. Even they, you know, you could take a picture with a with a fundus camera and get the measuring tools out and measure it all up. But after you do it for a little bit of time, you could tell, you know, like you said, small, medium, or large. And, you know, large nerves are going to have larger cups and smaller nerves are going to have smaller cups. So mm-hmm. just be careful of those smaller ones with high pressures because it takes a lot more atrophy to create that, that notching. Mm-hmm. So exactly the, the small nerves are very easy to miss a 0.5 cd in a small nerve might be more significant than a 0.8 in a large nerve and again as I'm, I'm, we're, t- we're talking like cave people here in, in terms of cup to disc ratio but it's easy to sometimes miss that uh, focal neural retin- or neural retinal rim damage but as i take a look and this right here is an is an average optic nerve and the first thing i always do and i i tell i've always told the students and residents is you mentally cut in half not this way but this way does the bottom look like the top that's what i'm looking for you know is it is it about the same is it symmetrical and if the answer is yes you're probably dealing with a normal nerve now i did mention the isn't rule now, anatomically, it has been said that the thickest neuroretinal rim is I inferior, followed by S superior, followed by N nasal, followed by T temporal, the isn't rule. So it should follow that, or they should be relatively, relatively the same. Now, remember the T, it comes at the end. You know, nerves can be have an oblique insertion or uh, an obliqueness to them where the temporal rim seems to be a little thin. I've also taught that temporal thinning is never the answer alone. By the time you have compromise of the temporal rim, the rest of the nerve is so damaged, we don't need to, to use that. You know, at that point, it, it it's like taking the, the pulse on a decapitated person, you know that they're dead. Greg, any, any thoughts on the, uh, on the isn't rule? No, um, it's, uh, I use it all the time. That's anything I'll point out. Glad you went over it. And I would, if you're not using it, uh, put the, put it into your tool belt. Mm-hmm. But there have been studies that have shown that it is not perfect and it doesn't always work. Well, the, the the comment that I guess would pop into my head, Joe, would be, you know, you mentioned it and worth echoing uh-huh. is you get tilted disc, obliquely inserted disc, myopic disc. Um, that makes it tough to use the isn't rule. But uh, like this one here and the one before that you had, you know, you could apply the isn't rule here. So 
Now, one thing I want to point out here is we have a large cup to disc ratio. And it's probably about 7.5, maybe 8. I don't know what your thought is, Greg. But if I were to cut this in half, does the bottom look like the top? And generally speaking, it does. Now, what I want to point out is look at the size of the nerve and the where the fovea is and the macula is, and you can see how large that nerve is. So we're going to have large nerves, or we're going to have large cups. Now, one thing we see here are the lambda dots. We call that the lambda dot sign. That is indicative of a very deep cup. They actually begin to see some semblance of the lambda pores. Does that mean anything in glaucoma diagnosis? Uh, generally, no. I don't, I don't think so. There have been some OCT studies that have shown that these laminar pores become slit-like uh, as glaucoma progresses. Now, there's also a condition here, a couple of things. So you can see some bean potting or bayonetting. Uh, those are bad if there has been loss of rim tissue, but with a deep cup like this, there may be some backward out or outward bowing. And you can see that this is so large, the vessels are somewhat nasalized. Now, nasalization is often a sign of very advanced disease. But you know, when I look at this rim tissue, it's all nice and pink. I don't see any focal defects. I do see some bean potting and, and, and depth, uh, some, some, some bayoneting, as they call it. But if I cut this in half, the top looks like the bottom. It's a large nerve, and I'm expecting this cup. Now, here's something important. This is a patient who actually had been diagnosed with glaucoma. The patient uh, had an initial pressure of 30 and 23, right and left eye, respectively. And I take a look, and the rim tissues looks, you know, large cup to this gray shell, fairly well pink, but we compare it to the other eye. What do we see? There's a degree of pallor, and we can see we have vertically oriented visual field defects. And this is just emphasizing when you have pallor in excess of cupping. Now, these are not end-stage nerves here, but it's definitely pale left nerve compared to right. And this is a person who had a large pituitary adenoma that was so large, it was actually compressing the posterior aspect of the left optic nerve, giving the central scotoma and hand motion vision. Now, here's a nerve that doesn't necessarily jump out at you. It's highly magnified, but I can tell you this was an average size optic nerve. As I take a, take a cut through mentally, you know, are we obeying, obeying the is it rule? Well, the inferior certainly seems thickest. The superior is a bit thinner. The nasal is a lot thicker. And the temporal is really fairly well... Uh, not, not even noticeable. So in a situation like this, I'm going to say that this person violates the isn't rule, that the, thin, the thinnest part is superior, and it's probably because there has been some loss of, of neuroretinal rim. So this automatically becomes a suspicious nerve. Knowing nothing else, I would commit to a glaucoma evaluation here. And another example we can see is a cut right in, in half. The thick, the inferior is thick. The, na the superior is very thin. Nasal is thicker, and even temporal rim is thicker. So we have a superior displacement of the cup because there's been some loss of neural retinal rim here. And this is a person. I even go further and say this patient needs a glaucoma evaluation. I'm going to say based upon this, this is a glaucoma yes to me. Greg, any thoughts here? Nope, I agree. Everything looks good. I, I agree that it's glaucoma. Yes. And many times, many times you, you don't have the error. You don't have it where it is so extreme that, as I say, even Stevie Wonder can see it. And one thing to point out here is a little bit of a disc hemorrhage right in that glaucoma prone zone. You know, on the optic nerve, superior, superior temporal, inferior, inferior temporal, they are the glaucoma prone zones. That's where disease is going to happen first. It's not going to happen nasally. It's not going to happen temporally first. It's going to be superior, superior temporal, inferior, inferior temporal first.
Joe, that's a good example there. If you want to point out the lamina carbosa, you see how the slit, see how they're slit down in there. When you see those down in there, you go get down that notch right there. When they're slit, like in the, in the, in the, the lamina carbosa in the center, they're round circles. And as you go out closer to the, uh, to the periphery, they become more slit like. So, you know, if you're starting to see the slit like ones there, that's where you could tell where you you have, you have, tissue or atrophy and now you can see those slits so you know it's not a huge one but that's you know it gets real confusing and i've heard people try to discuss it and try to explain it from this stage but that's a great one there because you can see the slits in that one and if you go around the rest of the rim you can't see them because they're all hidden by the tissue so that is showing you that there's tissue missing so that's just a great yeah. example and this would always be, be a glaucoma yes and I had predicted something a few years ago, and I'm kind of surprised it hasn't bore fruit yet. My prediction was the OCT manufacturers would use enhanced depth imaging and develop a normative database for the laminar tissue, because that's where a lot of this is happening first. And of course, when we see a patient uh, that has loss of neuroretinal rim that is significant like this, there should be a corresponding visual field defect. I mean, I've always taught my students, you should be able to predict what type of visual field you're going to see. Maybe not, you know, the, the mean deviation, but essentially the type of visual field that you're expecting to see before you even run it based upon disc appearance. And this is another nice example. This is end-stage disease. There's virtually no neuroretinal rim from, I guess you can say about five o'clock to seven o'clock. You know, of course, you're going to have a very much denser superior defect than inferior. But if you go around and look at what you see as the remaining neuro, uh, neuroretinal rim in this 0.9 CD ratio, it's still pink. It is still pink and perfused. Now, you may want to call it pale because you're looking at scleral tissue, but if you have rim that you can see, it's going to be pink. Now, here is a great example I saw. This is a bilateral situation that was sent to me several years ago uh, for a neurologic issue. This is a person who was felt to have a 0.5 CD ratio and had really dense superior and inferior hemifield defects, not consistent with a, a 0.5 CD ratio. And as you look at it, what you see is you've got some, some color change in here, sort of pale-ish. Right. One might say or be tempted to say that's the cup, but it isn't. That's the color. Here's the contour. If you look at the contour of the vessels, this is about a 0.85 to 9 CD ratio. And the other eye looked just like it. You had a, uh, a dense you know, color change centrally, but this sloped up to the neural retinal rim. So this is actually not a 0.5. This is 0.9. And no further workup was, was necessary. It was clearly glaucomatous. So when, you know, we always talk, you know, color contour, when in doubt, contour always wins out. Reality is, in most cases, color and contour do actually match pretty well. Now, looking at disc hemorrhages, they're going to be inferior, inferior temporal, superior, superior temporal, because this, these are the glaucoma prone zones. The lamina cribrosa is less structured and supported on the superior and inferior aspect of the pole. And nasal and temple, it's a lot tighter. So those that they those axons are having less support superiorly and inferiorly. And this is where glaucoma is, is beginning. So this usually occurs where notches and nerve fiber layer defects occur. You can have hemorrhages of the disc nasal temporal in the cup, they tend not to be associated with the glaucoma. Now, here's a, you know, a question that I've been asked a lot, and I'll, I'll get your opinion. You know, are, are disc hemorrhages, are they ischemic or are they mechanical? I've always got that question uh, asked of me. Greg, what are your thoughts? I think that they're probably more mechanical. You know, it's probably a combination of both, but I think it's more of a structural change, shifting around, uh, and then just kind of you know, choking off and creating that hemorrhage. I think it's more mechanical. 
I, and I, and I, I agree with you, Greg. <clears throat> and I was actually doing a lecture on this. I was doing a therapeutic course, a hundred hour course. I was participating in a hundred hour course. And one of the attendees, who, who, who may actually even be on the on the uh, on the webinar tonight, for all I know, asked me a question, and uh, about the mechanical because she I, I made a statement and she brought that statement forward to me, and you know the the question the question was, is a disc hemorrhage a sign of progression, or is it a risk of progression, and I. But a risk sort of guy. I always said it wasn't progression, it was risk. Because progression means something doesn't change, something's changed that doesn't bounce back. Visual fields that change don't usually get better. Uh, neurofibrillary defects don't get better. Uh, not just the neuroretinal rim don't get better. But disc hemorrhages go away after you know a few weeks. And when she posed the question to me, because I had said that these has been shown through enhanced depth imaging OCT, that there are changes in the optic nerve, the lambda cribrosa, that are occurring prior to the disc hemorrhage forming. And she said, well, wouldn't, wouldn't that be progression because there's been a change in the lambda? And I was lecturing, and as I was lecturing, I was running her question in my head. I was kind of doing two things at once. And at the conclusion, I said, you know, I agree. It changed my opinion. I said, disc hemorrhages are progression because, Greg, I do believe with you, it, it's mechanical. There are changes in the lambda cribrosa, and those changes aren't going, to, uh, aren't going to reverse. And eventually, notches and neurofibrillary defects and visual field defects would probably occur. Also, the reason I don't think that they're ischemic in nature is it could happen anywhere else on the desk, and you'd probably have more bilateral disc hemorrhages. But this is exactly what we're looking at. It's going to be small. It's going to be contiguous to the neural retinal rim. It's going to be in the nerve fiber layer, and it's going to be in that superior, superior temporal, inferior, inferior temporal zone. When they're elsewhere, I am less certain that they're glaucoma-based. A nice example, we can see a very faint nerve fiber layer here, flame or splinter shape nerve fiber layer, contiguous with a neuroretinal rim. Uh, it is relatively small in that glaucoma prone zone. When we see this fresh, they tend to look like this. When we see them resolving, you might just have a small spot of blood in the area, and it may not be quite as obvious as these are. But again, you have the nerve fiber layer defect, the splinter-shaped hemorrhage in that glaucoma prone zone. Now, here's a patient, and I think you, I, I know you, you, you've seen these before, Greg, and I think you're probably, you may want to have comment. I'll, I'll give you a, a brief uh, shot to do that. You can see the, this is the same patient uh, three successive uh, different times uh, over several years. We have a nerve fiber, uh, we have a nerve fiber layer defect, and juxtaposed here is a flame shaped hemorrhage or a glaucomatous hemorrhage. At another time, we can actually see another hemorrhage on this side of the nerve fibrillar defect. And later on, we have another one right here. And going from here to here, you can certainly see an enlargement of that nerve fiber layer defect. Greg, comments? Well, first of all, yeah, I've seen these before. And the, the, the first time I'm really seeing, like, that's some great photography and great luck that you're able to get those hemorrhages every single time because those hemorrhages only last, uh, you know, three, four, five, six weeks, maybe at max. Um, but what I'd like to point out is that notice how the, the, the hemorrhage is at the adjacent side of, of where the nerve fiber layer is, is the defect is. So it's not going to be in the center. It's already dead there. There's like, I guess you can never say never and always in medicine, but very <laughs> unlikely is it going to occur where there's already death, death to that, uh, to those ganglion cells that we were talking about that nerve fiber layer. Notice how it's always adjacent. So if you're having a, uh, a, a struggle, like, Oh, could this be from glaucoma? Could this be from a PVD maybe, um, you could just go by the location. Notice how they're all touching the disc. No, it's how it's all adjacent to an area that's already dead. So you're going from dead to where that little hemorrhage is occurring, and then you're going to get a, a dropout of nerve fiber there eventually. So, 
Yeah, those are great pictures, Joe. And, and if just... you also, uh, thanks, Greg. And if you also yeah. look at the vessel bend here, you can actually see how much tissue is in there between those two vessels and see how little tissue is in there. Why? Because the cupping has increased. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you go, if you just wrote down a cup to disc ratio at this state and a cup to disc ratio at this state, you're not going to see progression. You're not going to notice that how much wider that is. Photography is your friend. The, the camera is your, it's a billable uh, procedure. Go right ahead and take these pictures and look at them. You know, that's the only way you can judge disc progression so you have photographs. And you may have different color, you know, different cameras over the years, but pictures are pictures. They, they, they never change. Now, here's an example I've seen a lot. Here's something that's actually very temporal. Large CD ratio it is actually very temporal. This is a patient who, uh, who had a PVD. And a lot of times, these acute PVD seem to dump a little bit of blood in the cup. But it's not in the neurofiber layer. It is contiguous on this side of the neuroretinal rim. Uh, it is small but it's not also not in a glaucoma prone zone. So this is not one that I'm going to be concerned with having glaucoma. And this was actually sent to me by the internet for, for a consult on a, on a disc hemorrhage. And we take a look and, all right, it's in the glaucoma prone zone. It is in the nerve fiber layer, but it is not small by any means. We have some blood out here that is not contiguous. I got a little bit of blood right there. And we have an unusual vascular pattern that would uh, correspond to what we call collateral vessels. This is actually just a resolving branch retinal vein occlusion. Not to say that a person with a BRVO can't have glaucoma. You know, vein occlusions, artery occlusions, glaucoma, they're in usually the same demographic and patient profiles. Now, all those other hemorrhages, I, I've seen it from anemia, from hypertension, diabetes, uh, not, a number of things. But here's, here's the, the defining difference. We see this patient, it's a very large CD rate, large disc, large CD ratio. It was an ocular hypertensive patient at this stage. And there is a disc hemorrhage in the glaucoma prone zone, meets all the criteria with a very good nerve fiber layer. A year later, what do we see? There's a new wedge defect. PVDs, anemias, all these other conditions don't cause this to happen. All right, the notching, the nerve fiber layer defects when it's associated with this type of hemorrhage is always glaucoma. Anything, Greg? Joe, Joe we had a question come in. It says, okay. when the mechanical changes in the lamina carbosa, that's one comment, then it says, how long does it take for a Drantz hemorrhage to occur, question mark, and how long after treatment will it go away? The answer is, the first, the first part is, we don't know how long it takes. I will share with you an anecdote. I've actually seen a, a disc hemorrhage develop during my examination. And I was teaching at the time at the university. I had a patient who had a notched neuroretinal rim. I was showing the notch. I showed it to four students and the resident. We all clearly saw it uh, with a 90 diopter lens and teaching mirrors. Then I put the BIO, BIO on to do the peripheral exam. And at the end, I came to the optic nerve. I looked and said, that nerve looks very uh, hyperemic right now. So I actually sat back up to the, up to the slit lamp. And where the notch was, was now a disc hemorrhage that had not been there 90 seconds earlier. So the answer is, we don't know. Now, regardless of treatment, they will go away. The blood will be resolved within about six weeks, with or without treatment. Now, here's something I want to point out is parapapillary atrophy. Parapapillary atrophy is a soft sign. It is... It is not pathognomonic of glaucoma. It is sometimes made overly complicated. You know, they've named the, the various zones, the alpha zone, the beta zone, the gamma zone, the, the omega zone, and it just gets too complicated. Now, parapapillary atrophy alone is never the answer. It's never the diagnosis. But here's some nice examples to explain. Here we have a bit of a scleral crescent. 
All right. It is uniform. It is pretty well temporal. There's no irregular. It's not very large. That is meaningless. Now, adjacent to it is this parapapillary thinning, or what we call the beta zone. All right. That's the beta zone out there. And a little further out, and this is not always present, you may be a darker area called the alpha zone. The beta zone has been associated with glaucoma. The alpha zones have not. And the gamma, deltas, omega, or, or the omicron, or whatever you want to call them, they are, it's too complicated. Is there parapapillary atrophy there or not? If it is there, it may be an epiphenomenon of glaucoma, or maybe it makes the patient more at risk for developing glaucoma. We just don't know. But it is a soft sign. It's one of the things I do look for. Now, here's a caveat. I've seen advanced glaucoma eyes have no parapapillary atrophy. I've seen normal, uh, normal patients have significant parapapillary atrophy. And here's, I think, a, a really good example. We've got this very bright area here, which is nothing more than a scleral crescent. But this irregular atrophic area just beyond that is the beta zone, which may be associated with glaucoma. And this is a, really a nice example, the, the alpha zone, which is, tends not to, mean, not to mean really much of anything. And here's a... A great example, I love, I love this one right here. We have some parapapillary atrophy out here. You can see how it is atrophic, a very darkly pigmented alpha zone out here. Now I'm not gonna do a glaucoma, the glaucoma, yes, glaucoma, no. This is one of my former, uh, this is my former residents. Perfectly normal, normal OCT, normal visual field, no risk factors, wicked, as they say, in, as we say up in the Northeast, wicked, wicked bad uh, parapapillary atrophy. That's what I mean by meaningless. You know, sometimes it can be meaningless. Now, a question we get asked all the time, or sometimes, is does parapapillary atrophy change? And question two, does it mean anything? Or what does it mean? Well, question one is, yes, it does change. And here's an example of a glaucoma patient where photographically, I have shown there has been a change in parapapillary atrophy over several years. That being said, we don't know what it means. It has been recorded so infrequently that there has really been no, as far as I know, any studies on what it means. We think it probably means advancing disease. We just don't know. And it probably happens more often than we realize is that we don't pay attention or we don't have the photographic, uh, photographic proof that it does change. Greg, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, well, I was actually kind of excited to hear what you had to say about it, Joe, because I always hear about parapapillary uh, atrophy, and it's always been confusing, like you said, the beta, the alphas, the omicrons, the deltas, whatever. Um, I've seen it change over time, but, but if I put a, a lot of weight to it, I haven't. Um, I've seen it change whenever uh, you know, the visual field hasn't changed. Uh, I've seen it change, and there's been visual field change. It's just you know, seems to be part of, you know, this, you know, this area where the disease is occurring and they're, they're just, it's just happening. So it's just hard to put a lot of weight into the, you know, oh, they, they have peripapillary atrophy change. I need to lower the uh, IOP. I just don't, I just don't see a lot of value to it. We've actually seen this you know, anatomically. We have these these axons that are arcing around in the arcuate zone to form the optic nerve. And anatomically, it's going to be thin, temporal and nasal, and anatomically thicker, superior and inferior. There's sometimes what we call bundled or split bundle defects because of the major retinal vessels. And here's this nice example of a, of a large cup to disc ratio and an otherwise good looking nerve and really a profound nerve fiber layer that looks uh, symmetrical and, and very impressive. Uh, compare and contrast that to this darker area down here. We have some thin area. It looks like we have some uh, abnormalities here. And this is this is focal damage of the neuroretinal rim. Now, this is a patient with recurrent uveitic 
optic uh, pressure spikes. The optic nerve, we take a look at it in isolation, looks really very robust. It's, a, it's very, very impressive, but we can see there is a large wedge and a slit defect right here. Now, sometimes we can have pseudo defects, and I wish I put my example in, I don't have it. But for a nerve fiber layer defect to be classified as such, it must, must be at least as wide as an arterial and reach all the way back to the optic nerve. Things that don't do that is just an anatomic variant and is known as a pseudo defect. And here's a nice example. We have a wedge defect here. We have some notching of the neural retinal rim. And I don't think I actually threw this in. I may have an example. If I, if I do, I'll show it. There's something, there, there's this phenomenon that's called a pseudosclerotic vessel of Salka. And a lot of times you'll see, and I've actually did this lecture before ophthalmology residents, I would show this very, very uh, bright arterial, which looked sclerotic. And this is not the best example that I, that I have. And, you know, they're all saying, you know, needs a workup for branch artery occlusion. The answer is no. You will often see that very pseudosclerotic vessel in an area of widespread diffuse atrophy for the simple reason is what used to be over top of the vessel is no longer there. So if you see what you think of these, a, a sclerotic vessel in a glaucoma patient with lots of nerve fibrillary defect, that's how it should look. It just doesn't look the same because the overlying nerve fiber layer has been stripped away. And a nice example here, the red free photograph is wonderful for looking at. We can see a notched neural retinal rim, may or may not be a hemorrhage, kind of hard to tell. I love the red free photographs. And I guess you can call this maybe a pseudosclerotic vessel right there. It looks like it is sclerosed. It is not. It's just how the vessel really would look if there's no nerve fiber layer over top of it. And here's another example. We got it flame-shaped hemorrhage. We have a wedge defect, a notch neural retinal rim. If you look at the glaucoma, at the optic nerve, you can make a diagnosis of glaucoma, yes, glaucoma, no. Now, we all know that in any sort of developed nation, if they ever ask you what percentage of, of patients with a glaucoma are undiagnosed in Germany, France, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the answer is always 50%. But what we don't know or don't realize is sometimes the prevalence of overdiagnosis of glaucoma is, is significant. In this population study in Greece, uh, two thirds of the patients were overdiagnosed gla with glaucoma, and they could not confirm it on uh, on, on subsequent testing. So we want to make sure we don't overdiagnose glaucoma either. So Greg, we're going to have if I get all the way through fourteen. 14 polling questions, and this is number one. Polling question, glaucoma yes or glaucoma no? Very simple. Based upon all the heavy lifting I've done so far and talked about the optic nerve, and if you, if you need to, you can left-click on the pole and move it aside. That tell you anything about the patient. Is it a glaucoma yes or glaucoma no? I used to ask the students, if you say glaucoma, yes, you have to tell me glaucoma, why? All right, Greg, maybe we should end the poll here. There are a couple of other options, and the majority say it's a glaucoma, yes. Some say glaucoma, no. If I cut it in half, does the bottom look like the top? Nice rim tissue here, very thin rim tissue down here, and kind of a bean potting, bayonetting from neural retinal rim. So this is going to be a glaucoma, yes. That brings me to poll question number two. And we look for nerve fiber layer. We look for disc hemorrhages. We look for notching. We look for violation of the isn't rule. Is this a glaucoma? Yes. Or is this glaucoma? No. And I just put the handout again for a second time into the, into the chat box.
Thank you, Ray. Can, you can, see, can you see the question? Nothing's popped up. Oh, hold on. There's one that's here now. There is. Um, it got hidden when I put the uh, hand out in there. When peripapillary atrophy changes, would it correlate with a change in myopia in high myopic patient? Theoretically, yes. If they had degenerative myopia, uh, axial myopia, run of the mill myopia, I don't think so. Good question, though. All right, Greg, maybe we should end this one. So glaucoma, yes. Glaucoma, no. The majority say glaucoma, yes. I cut it in half. What do we see? Is it symmetrical? We have a superior rim much thicker than the inferior rim. We see a little bend of the vessel there, and this is a notch neural retinal rim. All right. Polling question number three, glaucoma, yes, glaucoma, no. And this, our, our goal as good glaucoma practitioners would be to make a diagnosis or at least a strong suspicion based upon optic nerve and no other information. So this is a glaucoma, yes, or a glaucoma, no. We know where to look. We know what to look for. I think people are doing very well. We're, we're having rapid responses. They seem to be picking up what I'm putting down. Okay, we had a good response. Majority say glaucoma, yes. Again, cut it in half. Does the bottom look like the top? I see good rim tissue up there, a little bit of parapapillary atrophy, but as we said, that is never the answer alone. I don't really see much vessel that or much uh, rim tissue down there. It seems to kind of just emerge. And if you look at how well you see the coronal vessels here versus up here, that's representative of very diffuse atrophy. And this is a glaucoma, yes. Let's do another quick one. Glaucoma, yes, or glaucoma, no? Can be a tough one. People are responding very quickly. I got I got a few fillers coming up, Greg, to uh, deal with our uncomfortable silence that we have during during the polls. Great. I'm not going to say these are easy. Okay, excellent. And majority say no. And if we take a look, what do we see here? It looks like there is loss of temporal rim. Does loss of temporal rim ever happen in glaucoma? As the first sign, the answer is no. This is a significantly obliquely inserted nerve. Patients 20, 20, patient is young. We can see good striations of the nerve fiber layer. This would actually be a glaucoma, no. Now let's throw some information and start making it confusing. Let me give you some give, give, give you some info and really make it challenging. Now this is going to be called, require some memory. I'm going to go through three cases, rapid cases, three cases. I want you to tell me which of these three patients do you most suspect has glaucoma, and I will give you an I will give you a hint. I'll give you a lead. One does have glaucoma. Okay, patient one, 28-year-old female. Her pressure is 11. Central coronal thickness is 610. I mean, gee, Greg, if we, if we did convert, I mean, how low can that be? <laughs> I mean, obviously like, a very like, large like cup to this ratio. <laughs> right, let's take a look at that. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Patient two, 56-year-old male. His pressure is 22. Central coronal thickness is, is 598. Now, of course, the things we look for is, I mean, obviously, we again, just a reminder, size, color, parapapillary atrophy, 
focal nerve fiber layer defects, focal rim defects, disc hemorrhages. So these are all things we want to look for. 56-year-old male, pressure 22, thickish cornea. And patient number three, 64-year-old female, IOP is 31, and central corneal thickness is 490. So those are three patients. So polling question, which patient, if patient has glaucoma? Is it patient number one, patient number two, patient number three? Somehow we have to get some sort of sound effect where like they used to use in the old time game shows. Okay, people I are, do, are. I don't know how to do that without bumping you off. Maybe I have to put it on my phone and I can play it through my speaker here. It might work. I used to have a sound effect uh, app on here, but I don't have it on here anymore. So. No. Oh, okay, we got great participation, ninety percent already. Let's end the poll and share the results. And the vast majority said patient number three. Some people said patient number one. Some people said patient number two. Vast majority said patient number three. And let's take a look at our patients again. And the reality is, it's this one right here. We see that there's a thin neural retinal rim. We cut it in half doesn't quite look the same. And there is a reproducible visual field defect. Now, what I wanna point it out is patient number one and patient number three are the same patient. It's exact, the exact same, one is just in, in black and white. This is a patient who had a large cup to disc ratio, had a normal nerve fiber layer, but I biased you, all right? If you think this person has glaucoma, you have to think this person has glaucoma based upon disc appearance. So I did trick you on that one a little bit. It's exactly the same one. So when diagnosing glaucoma, take pressure out. Forget the pressure. I biased you. Same patient, made it unlikely, very likely, same nerve. So ignore the pressure when you start trying to diagnose it. But when you manage it, you got to put the pressure back into the equation, but that's going to be another lecture altogether. So glaucoma, yes, or glaucoma, no. 34-year-old Hispanic female, highly suspicious optic nerves, pressure statistically normal, 13 average corneal thickness, has been treated for normal tension glaucoma previously. Now, there are her optic nerves, right nerve and left nerve. And there are her visual fields. Now, large CD ratios, obviously, large nerves. You know, look for the features. You know, this is the glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no. There are her visual fields. That brings me to the next polling question. Glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no. It is patient of glaucoma. Now, Greg, I put this in here to uh, kill the uncomfortable silences that we often have. This is Keith Richards doing a, doing a photo op at the uh, gravesite of his former physician. This is the same physician who told Keith in 1978, based upon his lifestyle, addiction to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, was going to die in six months. So Keith is having the last lap here. He's here and his doctor is gone. In fact, Keith said this doctor is one of 37 who made the same prognosis, prognostic uh, uh, for him. So the only difference is they're all gone and I'm still here. So sometimes when we make our diagnoses and prognoses, we can be wrong. All right, I'm going to end the poll here and share the results. And some say yes, some say no. And these are repeat visual fields. And she had a normal OCT. She had very, very large optic nerves. And what I always say is, if you insist on having a suspicious nerve, you better be a good field taker. Otherwise, don't complain if you get treated for a disease that you don't have. And I'm going to back up a little bit here. And here's a caveat. It's not in the notes anywhere, but here's a clinical pearl. These are very large nerves. When you have a large nerve, a, a megalopapillae, the superior rim can be thinner than other rims and still normal. 
Don't know why. I have no anatomic explanation, but I've seen it many times in, in large nerves. You can have thin rims severely, and they're still normal. So that's the violation to the ISN rule, right, Joe? That's yes. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the violation to the ISN rule happens with a macro disc, or what do you call it? A uh, something. Uh, the there you go. I'll say a little word about OCT and GCC. Yeah, you know, if we look at it, you can see it as, as Greg pointed out. Yeah, you know, they, they get these long, you know, ganglion cells. They're all one defect. You know, you take a look at it, you put them together, and you see it's all one defect. Now, at least I mean, we I've used a number of devices. One thing I've noticed on the series is. The thickness map is very, very helpful. And it has actually been shown to be the most sensitive at identifying nerve fiber layer defects. And we see the ganglion cell complex, if we put it actually together, it is all one defect. And this is what I call the nautilus shell, uh, at least on this device and some of the other devices, it's not quite as apparent. But when you see a, a cut at the horizontal rafe on a GCC, that is very compelling to me. I call that the nautilus shell of South Bend. So if you take a look at that and you see that nautilus shell, it's pretty impressive to me. And we can see the that cut right there at the horizontal. We can see a corresponding wedge defect right there. You put them together, it is the nautilus shell, and it is very compelling. Well, here's a glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no. 62-year-old female glaucoma suspect. Pressure... Uh, is 17 and 18 on multiple occasions. I didn't get a pachymetry on this patient before their loss to follow-up, 2020. Biomicroscopy normal and angles are open. Let's take a look. Here is the, uh, the OCT. I want you to look at the thickness maps and everything we just told you. And one thing I will, I will point out is everything kind of falls within the statistical norm for this device. Everything is green. Uh, I don't see much reds and yellows. So the question is, is this glaucoma yes or glaucoma no? It looks like we might have a wedge defect. We might have that early nautilus shell cut right there. Pressure is not all that impressive. Everything falls in the normative data range. And there are the visual fields. So in the eye that looks maybe a little bit more robust than OCT has the worst visual field. The eye is more suspect. The left eye has a within normal limit. So that brings me to polling question number seven, glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no on this patient. Now, Greg, I'm not going to pimp you on this one because I don't expect you to know this, but uh, you know you know the four lads on the right, those are the Beatles. Now, I you could may recognize know, that one. Yeah, you may not know the one, the guy on the left, that is Dick Rowe. He was head of A&R at uh, on Decca Records. And he became very, very famous as the person who turned down the Beatles. He said they they weren't very good. They had very little talent. They were going nowhere, and guitar bands are on the way out. So he became very famous for being the person who turned down the Beatles and didn't sign. <laughs> and this Oops. is you know this is a whole lecture in a, in a whole science of trying to make assessments and doing our best assessment. Sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. So, Joe, back to my soapbox, you mentioned, uh, you know, back at the beginning of this case, 62-year-old, 17s and 18s, no PAC imagery. If we got PAC imageries, would that influence us? Because really, this patient couldn't be in the ocular hypertensive treatment study. So would we, would we want to apply any of that to this? Or how does that work when the patient's coming with normal pressures? I still like to have it because, you know, we can't correspond, but you know, probably if it's thin, we're probably underestimating. If it's thick, we're probably overestimating. So I'm, I'm going to end the poll and we're pretty close on, the, uh, on, on, this, on this one. You know, I'm almost 50-50 glaucoma yes or glaucoma no. We have to do a so recap. Are you, a, are you a dick row or, or, or are you not a dick row? If you take a look at the old photographs, what do we see? In 2012, 
pretty normal nerve fiber layer, and we have a disc hemorrhage. And we look at the photograph, we have another disc hemorrhage several years later, and we have a new wedge defect. So this would fall under glaucoma, yes. And what is the most compelling thing here? The pictures. Take photos, the camera is your friend. And you take a look, you can kind of see it right there. Uh, on another device, it does trigger the uh, normative data range, but even still, you can see a significant inter-eye asymmetry in that inferior area. So we kind of look at everything together to make our best assessment. And so even though this one doesn't go into the norm, trigger the normative beta database, this one does, but we can certainly see there is a inter-eye asymmetry. Any thoughts here, Greg? No, you took the words right out of my mouth there is that, you know, on these OCTs, you got, you know, glaucoma luckily is asymmetric. It's, you know, in most cases, it's worse in one eye than the other. And if you look in that glaucoma prone zone, you get down to those, that, that clock hour reading, you got 147 in one meridian, you're down to 90 something, 96 in the other meridian. I mean, that's a pretty big difference. I mean, that's like 50 microns. Uh, in that glaucoma prone zone. So it's within that green zone, but it's definitely asymmetric. So good pointing out. Well, here's the glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no. 56 year old male who had been a suspect at my university uh, in the primary care clinic for a number of years. Let me give you the information here off of glaucoma flow chart. Pachymetry 54532. Glonioscopy is there, it's all nice and open. We can see the pressure. It was peaked at 32 and 31, but for the most part in the low to mid 20s, we can see it over time. We can see the cup to disc ratio here. Um, and this is, this is what I mean why how spurious this is. In, 2000, uh, in November 2014 is a 0.45 cup and a couple of weeks later is a 0.4 cup. It got better and then it got worse again. So we can't just really go by that. So we take a look at this. And what do we see here? We look at our thickness map. We certainly look at our deviation map here. We look at the ganglion cell complex, and there are some abnormalities or some departures from the normative data range. We don't quite have that, uh, that nodular shell going on. The ganglion cell seems to be pretty pretty symmetrical, pretty robust, and it does maybe look a little bit better in the right eye than the left eye, but a lot of things except here fall in the normative data range, or except for this. So that brings in polling question number eight. Is this a glaucoma yes or a glaucoma no? I'll go back and show you again. There's the, uh, you, saw, you, saw, you, saw the you saw the data here, pressures, pachymetry, gonio and nerves. We see the, uh, Neurofibrillary and ganglion cell complex. So I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated. Is it yes, both eyes, no, both eyes, yes, right eye only, or yes, left eye only? I'm not sure if we're adding, if adding information makes it easier or harder. So people are engaged, people are thinking about it. The answers are coming in a little bit slower on this one. All right, I think we're up to 80%. All right, so kind of split, pretty good. Um, yes, yes, both eyes for a few people. No, both eyes a few people. Yes, right eye only, fewer. Yes, left eye only. That's uh, that is the prevailing thought. Okay. Now we take a look, and what do we see? I look in that glaucoma prone zone where we saw that normative database being violated, and it doesn't really look all that it doesn't really look all that bad to me right there. But what I want to point out is. What do we see over here? We have a large wedge defect. Now, if I go back, you can kind of see it right there. 
you can kind of see it right there. So this is a person you might say has green disease in the right eye and red disease in the left. So we look at the photographs and clearly in red free, we have an abnormality. And we look at the past visual fields, one, two, three, four times he had corresponding visual field defects. His other eye, the more suspicious eye was normal. So is he really a glaucoma suspect? No, he's a glaucoma, yes, at least in the right eye. Any thoughts here, Greg? Actually, Greg, you're muted. I'm, I'm not hearing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was well, I'm off mute. So, um, yeah, with, with the comment I was making was, is that, you know, but this is why you just can't put all your eggs in one basket, right? You got to look at the nerve, all the things that you're talking tonight about looking at the nerve, taking pictures, looking at the visual fields, and then using the other tests and, you know, making sure uh, that uh, that it falls within the data. Um, normative database, you know, the key that everyone needs to realize with these OCTs that are out there, I think the biggest normative database that's out there is like 750. But remember, these are people that are just perfect eyes, low myopes, low hyperopes, emetropes, no tilted discs, no uh, obliquely inserted discs. So you have a very small database of about 750 is the biggest normative database of people that are not nearsighted or farsighted, tilted, no disc abnormalities. And then you take something that's normal and you're layering it on the things that are macro and micro and tilted and so on and so forth. So you just got to be a little bit careful whenever you're looking and using that, what Joe keeps referencing, green versus yellow versus uh, red disease. You know, interestingly, I, I was doing a conference, and I think I was in Trinidad at the time, and somebody came up to me and asked when I thought the OCT would become as sophisticated and accurate as an MRI. And my response was, I, I think it's probably as accurate, but an MRI has to be interpreted by a radiologist. And, you know, these things can be accurate. I mean, we, we find where the artifact is. You know, MRIs have artifact. We have to recognize the artifact and recognize when something is abnormal. So we have to interpret that. So it's not like it's far, far behind an MRI. I mean, an MRI without a radiologist is, is just a bunch of pictures that I don't know what to do with. Hey, Joe, got a question for you before you move sure. on to 66-year-old okay. female. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn says, how much or how much does hypertension play in glaucoma? The answer is, I don't think we really actually know. And here, here, here are our speculations. High blood pressure. It is pushing blood to the optic nerve. It is feeding the optic nerve. That could be a good thing. High blood pressure causes arterial sclerosis. That prevents blood from getting the optic nerve. It's a bad thing. Hypotension. Vascular system's good. Not much impetus to get blood to the optic nerve. A bad thing. So the reality is you have to have perfect blood pressure. It can't be hypertensive. It can't be hypotensive. Hopefully that, that kind of answers the question. 66-year-old female, 2020 angles are open. No abnormalities. Thin-ish corneas. Peak pressure, 18 and 16, glaucoma, yes, or glaucoma, no. So we take a look at it. Here are the optic nerves. So we're looking for parapapillary atrophy, disc hemorrhages, notches of the retinal rim, nerve fiber layer defects. And when I have, and when I have a red free, I'm trying to tell you, look at the nerve fiber layer. Okay, that is left eye. Here's right eye. And of course, when I, and I said, when I put up red free, I, uh, you know, my, my savvy students, when we when when did exams, the, the savvy ones would pick up. If I'm giving you a red free, I'm telling you to look at the nerve fiber layer. Okay, so that's the right eye. There is the, uh, the, the, nerve, the nerve fiber layer, OCT. We know what to look for on this now. We, we know some of the pitfalls. And here's our GCC. 
Maybe we have a little bit of uh, nautilus going on, but overall it's kind of weak compared to the nerve fiber layer there. We saw the pictures. So it brings me to question number nine. Is this glaucoma yes or glaucoma no? And then during this silence here, Joe, my comment to Carolyn regarding how much does hypertension play a role in glaucoma? I don't think it has much to do with the development of glaucoma. But I do think that when you have a comorbidity of progression in glaucoma, that it will, this up and down, back and forth, people on medications, people spiking, going up and down. I think that wear and tear has the potential for progression. So what I try to do is whenever I'm listening to a glaucoma lecture or trying to read a study or trying to figure out, are we talking for development of glaucoma? Or are we talking if a patient has glaucoma or progression? I try to separate those two out um, whenever you know we're doing different things. And so your question, Carolyn, would be more, eh, doesn't really do too much for me if someone comes in and has a pressure of 24, no retinal rim looks good, nerve fiber layer looks good. Is it really causing me to think that they're going to develop glaucoma because of that hypertension? Eh. But if they get damaged, now does that disease add to the progression? I think it does. So that would be my kind of way of looking at it. All right. So on this one, the majority say glaucoma, yes. Some people say glaucoma, no. So here are the visual fields. And what we can see is there's a fairly symmetrical inferior arcuate defect going on. So let's go back. And what do we say? You know, so there's some superior loss here. So there's a little bit of superior nautilus shell going on, although it's relatively, you know, kind of sparse. We take a look and it looks like there might be a wedge defect there. Maybe there's a wedge defect right there. We can kind of see it. We take a look and maybe there's something going on. It certainly is not as bright superiorly as it is inferiorly. We take a look. Very, very bright inferior, maybe not quite as bright. You know, you cut them in half. We also look at the nerve fiber layer. So this is actually a glaucoma, yes. 22-year-old male, who is an optometry student, and I opined on 2015, uh, fairly high mild, father has glaucoma, uses propanolol for a hand tremor. So he's got uh, a beta blocker on board and was additionally put on Timolol by a glaucoma specialist as well. Peak pressure in the mid to upper teens, I do not know what the coronal thickness is. I'm not sure if we have, if, we, if I gave you that, it would help us. His treated pressure was 12 and 13. This is a glaucoma yes or a glaucoma no. All right, let's take a look. And what do we see here? All right. Some things within the normative database, uh, a little suspicious, kind of a, a wonky nerve fiber, uh, nerve fiber layer on OCT, but again, high myo. We take a look and is there change of progression? Look, there's you know, a little bit more artifact in there. Our GCC, you know, we got these circular rings of abnormality, but I take a look and they they do look, you know, very symmetrical to me. So even though we have a, a lot, you know, it's not nautilus shelling on me. It's it's small and pretty symmetrical. And there are his visual fields. Okay, visual fields are perfectly normal. Now let's take a look at the optic nerves. I tell you, this is where all the action is. And one thing I want to point out is there's a hemorrhage right there. So this young man with lower pressures on a double beta, double beta blockade with some myopically questionable nerve fiber layer and GCC has a disc hemorrhage. We take a look and, you know, there it is. You know, there's not much parapapillary atrophy. He's got myopic disc to make it time, kind of tough to assess. And later on, he now has a hemorrhage right here. So we have one down here. Later on, we have one up here. 
so polling question number 10, is this a glaucoma yes or glaucoma no? Now we come back to Dick Rowe. He made a very famous mistake for which he had a hard time living down. Now, after the Beatles hit it big, he found himself sitting at a talent, as a judge at a talent contest, sitting next to one George Harrison. And he was very uncomfortable. And George was nice about it. Yeah, he held no grudges. So they were kind of beginning very amiable. And even though George you know, had been insulted by him two years earlier. And, and Dick asked George Harrison, is there anybody in the talent contest that's worth listening to? And George said, no, not really. But there's this group down the Crawdaddy Club called the Rolling Stones that we really like. And we think they're going to go somewhere. Without a word, he got up, left the show, went down, caught their act, and signed them immediately, saying it wasn't going to happen again. So if you make a mistake like Dick Rowe, hopefully you can, re you can, you can redeem yourself like he did. All right. Going to end the poll, share the results. The majority say yes. Some say no. The reality is, my opinion was, he was a no. His nerves didn't look glaucomatous. And we take a look. That's a very unusual type of hemorrhage there. You know, that certainly is in the glaucoma prone zone. He had no visual field abnormalities to support. He's not in a high risk category or high risk profile. My belief is uh, he was a glaucoma no. Now, my question, uh, or, or rhetorical, is: Am I am I Dick Rowe with the Beatles, or am I Dick Rowe with the Stones? I don't know. But as far as I know, he has had no changes. Now, let's really make it more interesting. Let's try to diagnose glaucoma in patients who have anomalous nerves, because everything I told you about disc analysis really aren't going to work. This abnormal anatomy is going to mean that there's an abnormal OCT. Now, field loss can be there, and it may be congenital, may be acquired. We don't know, unless we have very old records, which we virtually never get. So we have to look at other clues and risk factors. And when the nerve is anomalous, we got to recognize we're probably going to make a diagnostic error. But make sure the error has the least detrimental effect to the patient. We may, we, we may make a, a, a dick row mistake here. He's a 72-year-old male. He's got amblyopia in the right eye and dense cataracts in both eyes. He underwent cataract surgery in his left eye. He was about 2050 post uh, pre-op going in, 2050 post-op. No real improvement, no complications, and he's very unhappy with his outcome. Now, I got the, yeah, he, he brought with him the old records, and I, I would look at the, at the chart notes, and it was patient angry, patient upset, patient yelling, patient angry. So somewhere he got diagnosed with, he got sent to a glauco the glaucoma specialist uh, in this facility who diagnosed him with advanced normal tension glaucoma. His, his peak pressure is 22, average pachymetry, his treated pressure on a prostaglandin was, was the low teens. Now, I think, you know, reading these notes and, and knowing this person and, 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 and dealing with this fellow, this is what I, what I call kicking the can down the road. You know, it's the patient rope adult. Refer them on enough, and eventually they'll punch themselves out, get tired, and give up. And I think that was more the issue than thinking he really had glaucoma. It's just get him out of the uh, out of the cataract service and get him onto the glaucoma, smuggle him on the glaucoma service. Now, here are the challenges. He doesn't believe he has normal tension glaucoma. He has a semi-retired attorney who has time, money, and excellent internet access. And like a philosopher searching for truth, he will stop at nothing to discover what is truly wrong.
And he found me based upon stuff I had published on normal tension glaucoma. I was relatively local, so he self-referred in to see me. These are his optic nerves. Now, you've got a bad PSC cataract in the right eye, but you can certainly see this is an abnormal looking nerve. This is a marked tilted disc syndrome in both eyes. So he already has a, what I call a congenital ulna. Now, I think they're probably looking here and saying, well, there's no rim tissue there. So this is notched, but you can't call notching these anomalous nerves. They do look relatively symmetrical. This is an inferior conus or really inferior staphyloma that is characteristic of tilted disc syndrome. And here are the visual field defects. Now, how much of this field loss is due to tilted disc syndrome? Almost rhetorical question. And the field loss is left eye. Uh, unfortunately, phobia was off, but uh, we've got good, you know, there's no complication. The OCT was normal, nothing, nothing funky going on. You know, we have, we have symmetrical looking nerves and very asymmetric uh, visual fields. So we take a look at them. There are his optic nerves. He's got bilateral congenital defects, tilted disc syndrome. We have visual field loss. You know, is this extant or is this developing? We don't know. So it brings me to polling question number 11, glaucoma yes or glaucoma no? Anything in the, in the chat, chat uh, Greg? You're, you're muted again. It there is one. It says, um, "Would you take him off the beta blockers?" That was back to the. Oh yeah, the, the youngster. I recommend. I recommend he stop the med. I mean, I would take him off the or the topical beta blocker. He is on an oral beta blocker for another reason, so I would not stop that. That's not my purview, but I would stop that. I recommend stopping that drop. And then a question regarding uh, the normal tension. It says, based on the fact that normal tensive database is relatively small and on relative normal, in quotations, eyes, how much should we depend on use of it? I'm sorry, hit me, hit me with that one. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me look at that one. Yeah. Uh, no, it's relatively small, relative normal eyes. How much, how much, a normative database? Uh, as much as high tension glaucoma, to be honest with you, I mean, it's the, 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 norm, the norms are the norms. And we just have to apply. I don't think I would, would, would say more or less. All right, I'm going to end this poll. This is a tough one. I'm going to share the results. Uh, a small percentage say glaucoma, yes. Most say glaucoma, no. Well, we had questions. It was unusual. Things didn't add up. Um, the macular OCT was normal. The everything. You know, the I actually got an MRI on him, and it was essentially normal. He had a mucus retention cyst in the sinoid sinus. That unfortunately, you know, one neuro ophthalmologist said, oh, is absolutely causing your field loss and your neuropathy. And ENT said it is absolutely not causing it. So he travels across the country, gets more, more opinions. They're all conflicting. So my approach was do no harm. I, I said, look, I can't conclusively say you don't have glaucoma. You're using the medicine. It probably is wise to continue. 38-year-old female referred for glaucoma evaluation in 2002 after failing a LASIK screening due to thin corneas and uh, funny-looking nerves. She had been treated since, the mid, for, since her mid-20s for glaucoma. When I saw her, she was on no medicines. Uh, pressure in the mid to upper teens with no medicines. She had very thin corneas. And she had anomalous nerves with some mild field loss. We'll take a look, and there are her optic nerves. And I think we can see that they are not your normal nerve, particularly in the right one. Now, this is not tilted disc syndrome. This is a condition that I don't think has a, a great name. I call this a 
obliquely inserted and rotated optic nerve, not, not tilted disc syndrome. I think there's a difference. We have a lot of peripapillary abnormalities in one eye. The rim tissue that it, this is not pale has a little bit of field loss, a bit of a nasal step, and the other eye has nothing. Mid uh, upper teens, thin corneas had been treated for glaucoma in her mid 20s. Is that unusual for you, Greg? I find that kind of unusual. Yep. Very, well, at least where I live, very unusual. So different population of patients, but. Uh... All right. So that brings me to polling question number 12. Is it glaucoma? Yes or glaucoma? No. I'm going to show you again. Mid to upper teens, no meds have been diagnosed by somebody else, thin corneas, and we see the optic nerves. All very funky with a little bit of field loss. Now you notice here are two, uh, two singles. It's the same song. One by Carol King, you've got a friend, and one by James Taylor, you've got a friend. And they're both they were both uh, released simultaneously. And one may wonder, how did this happen? Well, James Taylor had this song called Fire and Rain. And in one line, he said, there are times when I could not find a friend. And Carol King, who was a friend of James Taylor, heard that. She wrote this song in response. You've got a friend. And she played it for him and sang it to him. He was very flattered. And then he was recording his own album, and he started noodling around with it in the in the recording session, and his band kind of started playing in there, and then somebody hit record. And before he knew it, they had the song on tape, and he realized, whoa, we've gone too far. So he actually had to call Carol King and do a mea culpa and say what happened, and she was really peeved with him. She was very upset. But then she said, well, I did write it for you, so go ahead, you can have it. And that's how that same song got uh, released simultaneously on two different albums. Just a little factoid to kill the uncomfortable silences we have. So glaucoma, yes. Glaucoma, no. I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. Uh, some say yes. Some say no. Uh, my approach to, uh, to this was she had a little bit of field loss. She has funky looking nerves. We had a discussion and we followed her without treatment. And uh, after about 11 years, she had a little bit of visual field change. Keep in mind, she had very thin corners and high teen pressures. So what had happened was at that point, I started treating her for glaucoma. Her pressure dropped down to the nine to 10 range that kept her visual field stable. She had what I call congenital ulma initially, and as she got older, toward her toward her fifty, you know, toward fifty, she developed glaucoma from a thin cornea in a high, in a high teen pressure. And now has glaucoma, what I refer to as a double ulma. I call this one so similar yet so different. A 45-year-old female was referred to me for a glaucoma evaluation by a local optometrist. Uh, had, her pressure had never exceeded the mid-teens. Uh, average pachymetry, he had tried several medicines and really found no significant effect. And this is what she looks like. And you can see she looks a lot like the last patient who looks like uh, Janice. Now we see these obliquely inserted and rotated optic nerves. There's some pretty significant parapapillary atrophy here. If you look, you can see a very, very prominent choroidal plexus in there telling us there's probably not much nerve fiber layer. In fact, you might even see uh, some neurofibrillary defects juxtaposed to this um, widespread atrophy, a lot of parapapillary changes. I think the funkiest looking nerve is the right one, more so than the left. We see the visual field loss, and it's not really that impressive. In the other eye, we have a very dense field loss. Greg, what, what do you think? What do you think here? Or what, what's your opinion here on these nerves and what we're seeing? Yeah, I, 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 I. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes, you're good. 
Okay. All right. So I see these quite a bit. And yeah, I think the key here would be, you know, I not expected and that's not surprising the, the visual field defect that you're seeing in that left eye. Um, you know, the key here would be progression. You could follow this over time and make sure it doesn't progress. But to me, it looks to be you know, obliquely inserted, tilted. Uh, you got peripapillary atrophy. Um, you got a, a defect, uh, nerve fiber layer missing, um, probably just more anatomical. But the difference between glaucoma and in a in a in a in a in an anomalous disc, if you want to call it that, would be progression. So you know, if you feel comfortable with the parameters, you want to monitor this over time. This shouldn't progress. If it's glaucoma, then it will progress. Here, here's a question. I'm going to go to the, to the chat room and for, for a second. Do you see a reduction in the nerve fiber layer before reduction in the ganglion cell or, or the other way around in most glaucoma cases? And Mark, I'm going to say it depends. We never say always, never say never. Now there there was a time before we had before we had uh, ganglion cell complex or even even OCT. The question was, what changes first, the nerve nerve fiber layer or the visual field? And the answer was, it depends. Uh, for the most part, you saw change in the nerve fiber layer before you saw change in the visual field, but not always. And I think the same thing applies. You, I, I would say you probably see more changes in the macular region before you see in the nerve fiber layer region, most of the time, but not always. And as I showed you earlier, when you, when you put them together, it's all one defect. Now, Greg, about your observation, your your your. Joe, I want about... to feed off of what you just said yeah, there. So I'm going to add. I'm going to add another layer to Mark's question. Mark, you asked about you know retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell, and I agree, Joe, with Joe that it's sometimes one, it's sometimes the other. You just can't tell. But what about OCT angiography? Because we can now do look at the vessel density in the macula and in the uh, peri radial peri papillary uh, capillaries. Um, and the answer is it depends. Sometimes we see the dropout in the capillaries before seeing the nerve fiber layer in the ganglion cells. And then sometimes we see it still in the kind of the structural change versus the vascular change. So, um, you know, this is a tricky disease and where it, where it happens and how it occurs and how you pick it up is, is just can't always say always and never. So... Uh, Greg, talking about observation, we look at the field loss in this patient with, with anomalous nerves. And I felt uh, there's no real threat. So I'm okay, I'm okay watching something like this, which I did for about a dozen years. But we take a look at this one and we see how close, th this is a patient, oh, by the way, this is a patient of Japanese descent, if that means anything to you, where there tends to be glaucoma at a statistically normal range and their, their glaucoma and its baseline IOPs tend to be a little bit lower. Now, this is a person who is still 2020. If we look for progression, our, our first sign of progression might be, I don't know, 2080 vision. So it all depends. We're gonna, you know, if we're gonna make a mistake, make sure it's not to the detriment of the patient. This one, this one's good. I mean, I'm okay following this one for change over time. It's kind of kind of challenging on this one. So it brings me to polling question number 13, glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no, on this one. What do you think, Carl? Is the glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no? Comments on referring some patients for SLT versus uh, starting treatment with drops. SLT is a, a viable uh, primary first-line therapy, which works very well in some patients. Uh, drops are a viable starting uh, first-line therapy. I guess all be, it comes down to it, it depends. Are, are patients uh, adverse to drops or would, do they want something that's going to be take compliance out of their hand? That's very, very reasonable. So Claire asked glaucoma, yes, question mark, or treat, yes. That's a very, that's a very good question, Claire. I'm going to tell you what I, what I did in just a second. We're going to, I think we're going to end the poll and share the results. And majority say glaucoma, yes. Some say glaucoma, no. The answer is, Claire, um, glaucoma, I don't know. Okay, I, I, I don't know. But do I treat? The answer is yes. 
because when we look at that type of field loss, if there's any degree of progression, we might lose fixation. I don't know if this is congenital. I don't know how much was there. This looks worse to me, yet the field doesn't match. I actually took a few different medicines. I did find a prostaglandin that worked a little bit better than anything else. It did give me a, a significant pressure reduction. I followed her for about two years. Her visual fields changed not one iota on the medicine with pressure reduction, and she was mercifully lost to follow up. Now, if I did nothing, maybe, you know, maybe there uh, there would have would have been no change. I don't know. But uh, I felt I didn't feel comfortable just watching that. I think this, are, this is going to be our last one, number 14. 46 year old female diagnosed and treated for glaucoma in Jamaica. Bermonidine, Latanoprost, Timol fixed combination. They have that in other countries. Pressures 14 and 16. Uh, average pachymetry 75. Uh, Feels unreliable, high false positives, and patient looks like this. Let's go. Already diagnosed for glaucoma in another country on a beta blocker, prostaglandin, and fixed combination they had available there, and bromonidine pressures 14s. I don't know the peak IOP, uh, average pachymetry, large CV ratio, not a good fielder. And the patient looks like this. And this is just some glial tissue here. And this will be our last one. We'll wrap up real quick, Greg. So we see the, oh, th thank you. This will be a glaucoma, yes or glaucoma, no. There are the optic nerves. We, we, know, we know how to look at the optic nerve now. We cut it in half, look at the bottom, look at the top, look at the color, look at everything. We see the, nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell complex. So we're gonna let figure out, is this a glaucoma? Yes or a glaucoma? No, visual fields are not gonna help us out at all. And you think for the, uh, for the sake of time, I'm gonna end it, we have a good, and we're gonna share the results and some say yes and some say some say no. And what I want to point out, if there's anything here that is absolutely uh, compelling to me, it is I stopped all medicines. Pressure was up to seventeen and eighteen, and look at the size of the optic nerve: four two five and four four four. It's a what do you call macro disc or megalopapillae? Big CD ratio. What did I tell you before? If you're going to have a funny looking nerve, you better be a good field taker. Otherwise, don't complain if somebody treats you for a disease that you don't have. So with that, Greg, I think I've gone through all my polling questions. Uh, the audience was fantastic to get involved. This is as interactive a lecture I think that we can have with me sitting in front of a computer traveling out. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Greg. Yeah. So we have in the uh, chat box, Joe, it's a, so previous web, uh, uh, previous seminars, I was told if in doubt of glaucoma, always treat. What's your opinion? If in doubt, doubt is a, doubt is a big category. Yeah. What I said was, if, if we're going to make a mistake, we don't want to do a dick roll type of mistake where we're going to become famous for it. Yeah, I think she's mentioning in another webinars now. In other oh, webinars was told, not mm -hmm. what you're saying. So I know. But I, I'm kind of going to support it that do, do no harm. If you're not entirely sure, and it's one of these funky cases like we showed here, do no harm. Treat the patient. Yeah, I think that, you know, if I've come to a couple, couple you know, get handcuffed in a couple of these patients. I think you have to just kind of, you know, be honest with the patient. Um, tell them what you're scratching your head about. You know, I, I do a lot of glaucoma. You know, do I treat you, not treat you? I'm looking at this. This is the, this is the data. How are you feeling today? Get them involved, right? Just, you know, hey, you know, follow me closer. You know, observation is a, is a treatment. Or if the patient's like, you know what, doc, 
I don't have a problem taking the drops. I don't have a problem getting an SLT. Then, you know, go ahead and pull that trigger on it. But, uh, um, you know, don't forget to, if you're puzzled and scratching, ask the patient's opinion too, because they can maybe help guide you uh, a lot of the times. And if you're going to be observing these patients and they participate in the decision and they, they want to be observed, well, they know that they have they have some responsibility and culpability. They've got to follow through. All right, with that, I'm going to let you take on over, Greg. Wrap yeah, well, you want to take. Let, let, I want to make sure we get the question here. So, take a look mm -hmm. at Kelly's question while I'm sharing. It says regarding anomalous discs. Mm -hmm. Can you OCT. Do you have general guidelines? Which values disregards? Which values you pay more attention to? Uh, that's an entire Kelly. That's an entire lecture. the 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 answer is is no. I will tell you that on some of these devices, believe it or not, I I put a lot of stock in the pictures, in the in the in the thickness map and the GCC map. That tells me a lot. I also look at the grayscale in the visual field because that tells me when there's a neurologic pattern. So sometimes the simple things are actually important, and the thickness maps are actually really important to me. So, so Kelly, my advice on an OCT is there's a lot of inter eye, inter intra, you know, inter eye between the two eyes symmetry on OCT. I have a lecture on our website if you want to watch it. You get these anomalous discs. They could have some low values. The GCC could be um, I don't know, uh, say uh, seventy and seventy, or the nerve fiber layer could be you know low at ninety and ninety. Uh, but the key is symmetry. So if you got symmetry going on. Yeah, you know, we start getting asymmetric. The glaucoma is an asymmetric disease. You got to be careful with that. It's not always going to be glaucoma if it's asymmetric because you could have some type of swelling going on in the eye. But symmetry is usually your friend. Asymmetry, you got to scratch your head and figure out what's going on with it. And that is so, very important. You know, symmetry yeah. or lack thereof, that is incredibly important. When, so, when there is a gray area, making decision in glaucoma or not, how important is genetics and the race of the patient? Genetics, I don't know. I think you mean family history. Um, family history is usually the thing that gets patients, slightly, mildly suspicious patients prefer to me. You know, the doctor looks, they, they don't think there's glaucoma. They're not really sure, but they're pretty sure. And they say, oh, but some of my family has glaucoma. Bing, there's the referral. So it's a little bit important. I, I do, I, you know, I, I do pay attention to that. You know, older Hispanics, people of color, you know, they are, at, have a higher prevalence. So yeah, we have to put that in age, race, uh, family history. That's all very important. Yeah, and that might be going down the question. I think Avelina is coming out with a genetic test. Um, I just sat on some KOL board for that. And, mm -hmm. you know, stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a risk factor. It's going to be low, medium, and high. It's not going to really give you the answer whether they have glaucoma or not. Um, genetics is really cool right now out there with macular degeneration, keratoconus, glaucoma. Um, it's, I'm sure it's going to fall into place over these next few years uh, as, it, as a lot of us start doing it and trying to give clinical guidance. So just, just kind of stay tuned on that genetics question that's out there. So with that being said, to stay on time, I'm going to thank everyone uh, for attending. Uh, this is uh, uh, glaucoma, yes or no. And Joe, you did a great job tonight. And uh, I think the interactive part was going to be well received by the audience. So thanks for putting that all together. And now, Grant, I'm especially excited. The person who's taught POAG is always bilateral, true in your opinion. Uh, bilateral, usually asymmetric. I have had a handful of unilateral cases in my career. Jillian, the key quote to that is primary open angle glaucoma. Just be careful with those secondaries. That's the key. Primary open angle glaucoma is whew, most of the time going to be bilateral secondaries. Be careful with. <laughs>